Let's open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. I told Bonnie on the way over as we were riding through this beautiful, gentle rain in upstate New York, I said, Daniel 9 is one of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible. Number one, it has, I mean, uh, hands down, everyone agrees, the greatest prophecy in the Bible that connects everything. By the way, if you believe there's going to be a seven-year tribulation, you only believe that because it's here. It's the only place it says it's seven years long. Only place in the whole Bible. So you understand, this is huge to understand prophecy. But beyond that, Daniel chapter 9 is really the key to understanding all Bible study. And, and it gives us the correct perspective to understand the Bible. And thirdly, it's, it's where if you've ever been in a church and they had like a concert of prayer and they did the adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, you know, the ACTS model. I mean, it used to be popular like in the 80s and 90s. Um, that model is from chapter 9. I mean, this is, this is such a, an important chapter that this is the only prophet that talks about prophecy that Jesus names by name. Daniel. I, I uh, wow. Did you hear that? that? This is the only prophet that talks about prophecy that Jesus names by name. You, you heard you heard what he said, right? Such a, an important chapter that this is the only prophet that talks about prophecy that Jesus names by name. Uh, that's not true. Why would somebody why would he make that statement? talks about prophecy that Jesus names by name. Why would he make that claim? Uh, I, I, I can't, I just can't imagine why somebody, now look, these guys, hey, they don't know what the Bible says. He, what he might be saying is true, who knows, I don't know. I don't know what the Bible says. And just, I don't understand it. Why even make that claim? Uh, in Matthew 15, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he, Jesus, answered and said unto them, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy mother, I'm sorry, honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus, have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition? Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah say, or I'm sorry, well did Isaiah prophesy, prophesy uh, I can't even speak. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. So, right here Jesus says, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draws nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why would you leave that out? 
Why would you pretend like that was never in the Bible? Why would you say it doesn't make any sense to me? Jesus, <laughs> wow. That talks about prophecy that Jesus names by name. Unless you're sitting, you know, I, you know, I think somebody fooled this guy is what I think. Somebody fooled that guy and he believed it. Somebody probably told him that and he believed it. Probably doesn't read the Bible. I mean, how could you read the Bible and then make that claim? That, it's incredible. Now, Jesus is asked, what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And the very first thing he says is, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I, Jesus, am Christ, and shall deceive many. All right, so this is interesting. This is kind of, uh, you know, the, one of the points I want to make is that these guys, they're not experts. They're not scholars. They look like experts. He looks like, he looks like the smartest man in the world, doesn't he? But he's not. See, the key to understanding is faith. All right? So if you want to have, uh, you know, scholarly knowledge or expert knowledge, uh, all you need is faith. See, when you're, when you have faith, the, the the veil is lifted up over your heart, and you have eyes to see, ears to hear. All right, that's the key. That's the secret to understanding. It's not in extra biblical books. It's not by listening to experts and scholars. It's by believing the Bible that you hold in your hands. All right. So that's. I just want to share that, and then now, real quickly. I don't know if it's possible, but I'm going to try to. Uh, I'm going to try to make just a quick point here. And that is that it's the point I've made a hundred times already. All right, in Matthew 24, Jesus is asked, "What is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world?" So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of the world. It's Judgment Day. All right, it's the great day of the Lord. It is when we are resurrected. All right, it is when this old world passes away and then the new world begins. And that's the new world of everlasting life without any pain, sorrow, suffering, without any more death. That happens when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. So when he comes, it's the end of the world. All right, now... There's so many people that are teaching uh, false, uh, false uh, eschatology, and it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. It's not complicated. All right. So let me show you. Um, first of all, let's establish when Jesus is asked of the end of the world. All right, and he says, when he comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of the world. That's when the angels gather together his elect. All right, and one uh, thing I think that really makes it easy to understand is the parable of the wheat and the tares. In Matthew chapter 13, the harvest is the end of the world. The harvest is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. And the angels gather together the elect. All right. The angels gather together his elect. It's the end of the world. You see the parallels? All right. So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. And then... Um, Let's do it this way. Let's just try it this way. Maybe somebody will see it this way. Okay, so 
when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, all the earth will mourn. It says right here, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. All right. So let's go to Mark 13. And read the parallel here when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. All right. What happens when Jesus comes? Um, okay, so that doesn't it doesn't say, does it? It doesn't say after that tribulation he comes in the clouds of heaven. Okay, that's all right. All right, in Luke 21, let's read a parallel. All right, it says here that men's hearts will be failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. So in Matthew 24 it says all the tribes of the earth shall mourn when Jesus comes and then in Luke 21 men's hearts failing them for fear. Alright let's go to Revelation chapter 1 All right, in Revelation chapter 1 It says, uh, Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. That means those that killed him. That means the dead people. All living. Everybody that's ever lived is going to see him. All kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. So when he comes in the clouds of heaven, all the earth shall wail. All right, in Matthew 24 it says all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Luke 21 says men's hearts will be failing them for fear. And in Revelation 1 says that all the earth shall well. So the reason why everybody's going to mourn and everybody's going to wail and men's hearts are going to be failing them for fear is because they know it's the end of the world. Right, that's what Jesus was asked, and that's the answer that he gave. So it's interesting because we now see like 99% of preachers in the world today. 99% of the experts and the scholars today they preach this idea that unsaved people will still be living after Jesus comes in the clouds and they'll even say there's a thousand years you know they like to talk about this idea of the seven year tribulation it's not in Daniel I can't show it to you because it's not there they like to teach anything and everything but the simple truth that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's the end of the world when he comes in the clouds look up lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh this is a prophecy that goes all the way back to Genesis 3 when the Lord says to the serpent I will put enmity, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel it's a prophecy that's taught all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation all throughout the Bible when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven then will Jesus stomp his foot on the head of the serpent destroying all iniquity all evil forever and ever and this is all throughout the Bible the same thing over and over and over and over alright the same thing is being taught all throughout the Bible. Alright. 
every man in his own order Christ the first fruits he is the first resurrection all right and afterward they that are Christ that is coming all right Jesus is the resurrection Jesus plainly plainly says I am the resurrection and it's funny because all these people are um, uh, what am I looking for here all these people are wondering what is the uh, what is the first resurrection of Revelation 20 and they'll even start talking about a second resurrection maybe even a third resurrection and it's interesting because I don't think this is what I'm looking for it's interesting because Jesus is the resurrection what am I looking for John 11 why did I think 21 yeah. I don't think I've had enough coffee oh where am I at here oh I know I remember now I'm, I'm sorry here I forgot in verses 25 and 26 25 Jesus said unto her I am the resurrection it's interesting people are trying to figure out what is the resurrection what is the first resurrection and the Bible's very clear Jesus is the first resurrection and we are the partakers of his resurrection blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power and so we read here I am the resurrection and the life he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live the second death has no power over us that are born of God and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die on such the second death has no power right so how how is it that you can't figure this out this is simple stuff this is prophesied all throughout the Bible over and over and over he must reign till he's put all enemies under his feet when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven who's gonna be at his feet his enemies and then what happens he's gonna stomp his foot on the head of the enemy all right fires gonna come down from God and devour them when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is judgment day it is the great and terrible day of the Lord it's judgment day it's the end of the world Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven that's it and all these people today all these preachers so-called experts and scholars all these guys that went to seminary school and all these people with act you know with um, access to these uh, ancient ancient manuscripts and uh, you know they talk to Jewish scholars and this and that and they just know so much and they got a lot of money and uh, they got a great big platform and and they're in, and have hold these great big conferences all around the world and they know all these people have all these connections but they're lacking one thing uh, they're lacking the truth that's what they're lacking you have the truth if you have a Bible you hold in your hands and you believe it's from God you have access to the greatest information anybody could ever have and you have everything that you could ever possibly ask for if you have faith the secret the key to understanding is faith it's always been faith 